Good afternoon. This is Real Estate 101. You in the right room? Hopefully you're, you're good. Uh, this is going to be a session where you get to drive us. Uh, there's a couple of rules. Uh, I'd prefer it if everybody were f closer to the front if you could and uh, like just raise your hand so we can flag you down. Our intent is to answer questions that the audience would appreciate, not specifically solve your corporate problem. Uh, and certainly we're going to be around after the session so we are able to answer questions at that time. We don't have a particular problem uh, with that. Uh, so the Ask Us Anything session truly is an Ask Us Anything, as long as it's of general applicability. Um, now I want to make sure everybody understands, do you all have the application loaded and you could all rate the session? Uh, just in case there's any confusion, the actual rating is 10. Make, make a note of that now because you're going to want to use that number later uh, as we go through it. We have three speakers. Uh, each is going to introduce themselves, and uh, then we're going to come back after they just say who they are and you know a little bit about their background. We're going to get into uh, maybe what we see is a, a short term, where is search going, and then we're going to open it up to the Q&A. So uh, why don't we start with Stefan? All right. Hi, everybody. <laughs> oh, come on, guys. You're so sleepy. So I'm Stefan Spencer. I'm co-author of this big beast of a book called The Art of SEO, third, third edition published by O'Reilly. And uh, yeah, it's constantly in need of an update. But this, by the way, who's ever read this book? Like, oh, wow, there's actually a few people who've read it. Who wants to read this book? Like enough that they'll come and get it? Seriously, who's going to be first? Yeah, you were too slow. <laughs> You're like, I'm, I'm not sure. You're welcome. But now you've got to read it. I also have uh, a little book called Google Power Search. Now you might want to come and get that one. No? Nope. OK, here you go. Social e-commerce. There you go. <laughs> so those are my three books. And I have been doing SEO since, gosh, the 90s. As long as this guy's been doing SEO, I've been doing SEO. Uh, since before Google was Google. You guys, do you guys know what Google was called before it was Google? Anyone? It's a great trivia question. You can use this at like party games. Back rub. Yeah, back rub. And I sold my agency, Net Concepts, in 2010, and I have a small SEO consultancy. I wanted to stay in the game. So reverse engineering the Google algorithm, I do that for fun and profit. So that's me. Hi, I'm Chloe Spencer. I am Stefan's daughter. We are both SEOs, but we are completely <laughs> separate. We run our own agencies. So I got started when I was just <laughs> Yes. I got started when I was just 14. I created my first business. Um, it was a fan site for Neopets, which is a virtual pet site that was really popular when I was a kid. I was a huge fan of it. I created a fan site on WordPress. I got it to the top of Google for ultra popular keywords. It became the most popular website in its niche on the internet. I then monetized the site with Google AdSense ads at age 15 and started generating thousands of dollars a month passive income. And then at 16, I started speaking professionally. And then at 19, I launched my SEO agency and I help clients around the world to increase their online presence, their traffic, their sales, and their rankings. So, and that's what I'm doing today. Oh, and she's been on MSNBC. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. yeah. She totally upstaged me. I've only been on local TV stations. <laughs> Proud dad. Yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, me. I'm Bruce Clay. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I've been around uh, really since the beginning, uh, three years before Google started. So that's quite a long time ago. How many remember there was time before Google? Yeah, there was. Uh, January of 96 I started and that was when Al Gore was inventing the internet. Uh, it's been a, a fun ride ever since. Uh, if you go to Google and search for who is the father of SEO, I own about the first five pages. Uh, I've written three books. Um, 
my first book, which is Search Engine Optimization on One for Dummies. Uh, used to be bigger than Stefan's, but then he decided he didn't like that, so he added some more pages. <laughs> That's the only reason he did it. Um, so we all have some books. We all have uh, years and years and years of experience. Uh, I'm pretty sure we can answer virtually all of your questions, so it shouldn't be really, uh, it should be a good session. Uh, and, and we do have a live internet connection if for some reason uh, it's appropriate for us to pull up a tool or, or show something, we can do that too. Okay, so one minute. What do you think is going to happen in the internet for search in the next year? I'll go first <laughs> with a little something. Um, search is definitely going to be hugely going into voice search, especially with you know Google Voice and Alexa and, and everyone searching for things using their voice. So it's not just about you know, ranking now on page one, but being that featured snippet that's going to be read aloud with voice search because you're really the answer, the number one answer uh, when people are searching for things. So that is really, really huge and going after those featured snippets is going to be more um, important than ever. Cool. Well, uh, EAT is going to become increasingly more important. EAT stands for Expertise, Authoritativeness, and Trustworthiness. This is something that uh, came out of Google. This is an acronym that Google invented in, when talking internally to their human re reviewers called manual raters, and this is in their quality uh, guidelines for manual raters. So why do, we, why do we care about EAT? Because all these human reviewers, and there are many, many thousands of them, are the training data for machine learning. So they're not hitting the big red button on your site, but what they're doing is they're um, providing qualitative and quantitative feedback to an algorithm, an AI, that is going to be much better than a human at figuring out whether you're credible and valuable and uh, just authoritative, right? And I have an article on Search Engine Land I recommend. Uh, there's no shortcut to authority is the name of the article goes into a bit more detail about EAT, and it's a, in, in particular uh, applied to uh, the YMYL space, y, your money or your life. That's another acronym that uh, Google uses internally. So it's going to be applied across the board, but it's especially focused on YMYL at this point in time. But yeah, if you don't have trustworthiness in particular, it's gonna be very hard for you to compete in the coming years. And the area I think, uh, I agree with my colleagues, but I, I think that what we're going to be seeing also is a lot of video. I don't know if you've been uh, aware of this, but this company called Google owns this other company called YouTube. How many are aware of that? Okay, show of hands. How many people believe Google's in the business of making money? Who owns YouTube? Google. So what I believe is going to happen is I think within a year, we're going to find more and more of the informational answers to questions that come up from Google will be videos. Video is one of the forms of the featured snippet. Um, there's others, but uh, video is one of them. Uh, I think if you find that Google has a result in the Google search results, uh, that is a YouTube video that people will have a tendency to click it. And when you click it, the first thing that you see is an ad, and that means Google makes money. So I'm expecting to see a great uh, surge in the number of videos that actually appear in what are referred to as search results. Uh, to continue, because of voice search and because of expertise, authoritativeness, and trust, what I'm expecting to also see is that the trust component is going to be turned up a lot. Because Google, when they answer a voice query, they're going to have to have a trustworthy response. So we're seeing a lot of things carry across all of these areas. The videos have to be uh, actually popular and answer the question. The voice search has to answer the question. And it's all going to be based on expertise, authority, and trust. So we're seeing that as uh, something that is overwhelming uh, SEO right now, and it's going to be something that applies to everybody. Yeah. So uh, that's where I see it going. 
All right, we're going to open it up for questions. Does anybody have a question? We have a microphone, so why don't we... We're going to work our way through. Yes? Well, I've got two questions, but I'll just start with the first one. So I have a men's health site, and I know my site got hit by the medic update. So I'm trying to figure out what I need to do to sort of fully recover, you know, because it's I, I have like product reviews on men's health products. So and I know they want people who are authority of some level, you know, in that in that product or that service. So I'm trying to figure out what I need to do to kind of sort of fully recover my my traffic having a health blog. Okay. Well, I can I can cover that um, from a trust and authority perspective, I would try and get higher trust, higher authority links, and uh, that might entail doing something that is really outside of the box. For example, I went and spoke at Stanford University for free and uh, on my own dime. It just uh, I got a link out of it. That wasn't an, uh, a given. I, I hoped I would get that, but that, w that was a very valuable use of my time and travel budget to go and, and, and speak at Stanford. Another example is I got published in Harvard Business Review last year, and that article linked back to my website. It's very hard to get into HBR, very, very hard. It took a lot for me to get into it. So I'm not expecting you to do that, but I would say try and go after that kind of the 80-20 rule of high quality links. The ones that have the highest trust are going to move the needle the most. So one link could be more valuable than you know, a thousand just mediocre links. Right. Um, right. And, and do you know what your trust scores are, like uh, cite, uh, your, your trust flow and citation flow scores in Majestic, or your uh, LRT power and LRT trust scores in uh, link research tools? I don't. So I probably need to figure out how to. Yep. And so how would, how would I find that? Well, Majestic.com is a really great analytics okay. uh, kind of link building uh, tool set, uh, as is LinkResearchTools.com. So okay. just uh, get a sub well, actually, you don't need a subscription with Majestic to just get those two scores. Okay. Trust flow, that's your trust. Citation flow, that's your importance. And then you can see, well, how skewed am I if I'm way more trusted, or I mean, if I'm way more important than I am trusted, that's a problem, right? Think of somebody who's important but not trusted. Right. You don't want to be that guy, right? I'm not going to get political, so uh, y y y you get it, right? That's, right? This is why, in part, you have uh, been hit with the medic update. It's not that Google is just specifically targeting your site. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah. the, it's the, the whole YMYL vertical, right. which you're squarely in, that gets... Uh, get smacked first because it's high stakes, right? If, if it's bad medical advice or, or, or bad alternative health advice and somebody dies and Google ranked that number one, that's on, that's on, that's on Google too. Right, so I want to get backlinks from more authority yep. sites. Yep, backlinks from super high trust, not just high DA, domain authority or DR domain rating, but actually extract out what the trust score is according to Majestic or link research tools. Yeah. So that's one thing. And then build up your expertise with having um, like the authors who are contributing to your site full profiles with their certifications and diplomas and all that. OK. One of the things that we found is that a lot of the sites that got hit with the Medic update when it first came out, it was trust-based. This is a your money or your life category. And what they were doing is they had high trust sites. These are solid sites, but they were selling products. And what they were doing is linking to sites that were not trusted. Right. As soon as you link to something that's not trusted, your trust drops to that score. So uh, what we've had to do in many cases to restore ranking is to remove links, the outbound links. Right. to untrusted environments. If you play in a bad neighborhood, you're a bad guy, right. basically. So uh, I think that a lot of what we've seen over time has been derivatives of that kind of an application. But if you link to somebody that is not trusted, you become not trusted. So I want to go back to my product reviews and find those links maybe that are not so high and remove them. 
And one thing to remember, uh, everybody understands the concept of a no-follow link. Mm -hmm. uh, no-follow links doesn't work on your money or your life. Okay. Google doesn't believe that a user on your website knows it's no-followed. So that trust is actually hitting you even if you no-follow it. Okay. it th so that is not going to exempt there. that link. Okay. Right? So any ad you sell, any kind of uh, placement as an affiliate, any kind of way you're making money, that's, that's okay as long as what you're linking to is not untrusted. You can't assume that a no-follow link is no-follow. Yeah, uh, Google came out with uh, their um, statement that it's a hint now. It's not an ab absolute directive that uh, no-follow. I want to touch on that question just really, really quickly in regards to Majestic. So when you're determining your site's authority, it's so important to know how you're reading these scores. Because if he doesn't know what the Majestic Trust Flow is, many of you may not either. So this is super, super important. Because authority is really the biggest piece of the puzzle when it comes to your foundational SEO for your website. So Majestic is one of those tools which is really great for kind of taking a look at what your authority is. Now this score will fluctuate. And it's not like, don't take it as the gospel truth or anything like that. You can also look at other tools. There's Ahrefs, you are, um, you know, other, other scores as well. But Majestic, I really like. So as Stefan said, trust flow is really the score you're going to be looking at the most. This score is out of 100. It is on a logarithmic scale, like the Richter scale. When you pull up your website, make sure you're typing in the root domain. Don't put in HTTPS, dub, 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 because then it's going to give you the trust flow of, your, your, of that URL, not your domain-wide trust flow. So make sure you're typing in your root domain and taking a look at that score. You're going to see that it's probably under 20 for the most part. And it, it, if you pull it up and it's like a 3 and you're like, oh, God, <laughs> that's that's common um, if you've just kind of uh, started your own site or you haven't built any links. So as you're building authoritative, high quality links, you will see that start to rise. But you just have to make sure you're building links that are authoritative themselves, that are uh, domains that have high trust flows themselves. Otherwise, it's not going to increase your trust flow and increase your authority. As Stefan said before, quality over quantity. 100%. So focus on building those authoritative links. And I'm sure you know we'll get into more link building questions further in. So I'll just leave it there. But I wanted to really explain how to look at your site's authority and, and how to use Majestic to take a look at that. OK, next question. Hi, my name is Mindy. I'm a blogger. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I've been blogging for nearly 10 years, and I have over 2,000 articles. So I've started going through the process of removing old content that isn't relevant to my site anymore, as um, some experts have suggested. Uh, and I've just wanted to get your thoughts on the best way to go about that. Right now, I have a page that's kind of set up like a 401 page where it says this, but it's a page I set up. Um, and it says this content is no longer available. Here are some of my other popular relevant posts. And I am 301 redirecting the old articles to that page. And then um, the other thing that I'm seeing a lot is I'm seeing a lot of um, Google Search Council errors for old tag pages, you know, like tag page 8, which drops off once I delete so many articles. And I'm wondering the best way that I should be going about all of this. Do you have uh, lots of tag pages? Yes. OK. Have, have you tried to de-index those? I haven't. OK. I would recommend that. You also have category pages, right? I do. OK, good. Because keep the category pages, ditch the tag pages. Tag pages are essentially spam these days. And uh, that's lowering the overall kind of, uh, reputation of your site. Think of your site like a tree. And you have several thousand branches, or, or leaves, which, whichever analogy you like, which are those pages. And some of those pages are better than others. The ones that haven't made the cut, you've just been deleting. If the overall tree looks unhealthy because there's so many thin content pages, duplicate content pages, obsoletes, just 
not relevant, useful pages anymore because they were talking about, I don't know, uh, CES uh, 2008 or something like that. Just It's not relevant anymore. Those sorts of pages should be called. Uh, that's content pruning. I also get rid of date-based archives. I get rid of, um, uh, it's just any kind of page that is a rehashing of all the other stuff. I also like using uh, optional excerpts in WordPress and, and writing unique teaser copy for each of the pages. So that makes the category pages containing unique copy from the permalink uh, pages. So those are just a few thoughts. Yeah, definitely everything that Stefan said. You don't want to be using those tag pages. They don't add really any value um, and pruning that. But category pages are definitely very important. And also, uh, a lot of times I see with clients is that they have their category pages um, and then they don't have any text, like it's just links. And then if you want that page to rank for any types of keywords, you need to have text, you need to have copy and content on that page. So always add in like a, at least a paragraph or two of some kind of text in there and make sure that it's keyword rich. Don't do any kind of keyword stuffing, of course, but make sure your title tag is optimized, your H1 is optimized with your primary keyword or keywords for that page, and then the first sentence or two of that, of that text copy. Um, so that's something that I really recommend doing as well for your category pages. And then just, you know, no indexing those, those tag pages and not using those anymore. One of the things that a lot of people forget is that a 301, uh, it actually will pass page rank. Uh, it would pass a penalty as well, but it will pass page rank, provided that the page you're going to has substantially uh, the same kind of information as the anchor text that links to it. So if you're redirecting everybody to a, a, a common page, you're not going to be harvesting any of that page rank. If you want to get those pages to be removed, Google, when they encountered a 301, they don't know not to keep trying to see if it comes back. So what you might want to do is put a noindex tag on these things and get them to be dropped from the index, put the 301, simultaneously put a 301 for user experience, but uh, don't try to harvest page rank on pages that aren't going to match because that overall is going to be a signal for Google that I have a lot of inbound links or even internal links that are with this keyword. They're going to mismatched pages. I wouldn't want to send a signal to Google that I have a lower quality website as a result. Okay, so any page that I actually delete, um, I should know, I should know index that? What we do is we put in a meta no index tag to get it to drop out of the index. Because the only way a page like that actually hurts you is, is if it's indexed and it's old and the quality is low. So drop it out of the index first. And then as soon as it's out of the index, then we can look at whether we're going to delete it or not. Is there a way to do that for someone who doesn't know what they're doing? <laughs> I don't know tech like code. Yeah, just use the Yoast plugin, okay, and then uh, I use that. there's uh, the no index options, like to no index tag pages and no index date based archives and things like that. So you can still have that capability on your site, but I would actually remove tag capability completely so that you're not linking, wasting a whole bunch of links on a page. Let's say it's a permalink uh, post page with 15 different links to different tag pages that you're no indexing, that's taking a lot of that juice away and, and not giving as much to the category page that you're linking to or to other important pages, landing pages, et cetera, that you're, you're linking to. OK, next. Thank you. Yep. Oh, by the way, how many of you knew that a 3-1 redirect passes a penalty if, if that uh, originating page has a penalty. Who knew that? Yeah, so many of you. How many of you knew that a canonical can also pass the, the penalty? Anyone? Like, okay, just a couple of you. Yeah. Does it also pass a benefit? What's that? It's, it's on. Does it also pass a benefit in that instance? The three yeah, a canonical can pass benefit. Yeah, okay. it can pass I, both. I thought you said that earlier. Um, the only, uh, on a 301, it'll pass a penalty typically if the penalty is associated with an inbound link network. 
Uh, whereas if it's quality of content, the new page has its own content. So anything that's associated with low quality content does not pass over a 301, but link type penalties would in fact pass over a 301. I'm, I'm going to lighten it up a little bit. Um, I've been in the business about 14, 15 years, and SEO has evolved quite a bit, as has the advice. And there's been several SEO presentations at this show and at every show. And my question is, who the hell should I believe? <laughs> Us? Yeah. Just, just uh, your mileage will vary, for one thing. And take everything that you hear with a grain of salt, just because somebody says this is the, the way it works, test it. Confirm that it actually does work. So somebody says, for example, that uh, you can add ampersand num equals 9 to the end of a Google SERP URL to drop the featured snippet to see what your, uh, your position would be if you had the featured snippet and now you've been de demoted to page 2. Did you know this happened uh, last week? Yeah, a couple of you. So if you had position 0, the featured snippet, and you had position 1, you now ha just have position zero, and you're on page two. Perhaps you would get more click-through on position one than position zero. That happens a lot. So you might want to de-optimize, not get the featured snippet, which you use the max snippets uh, tag for that. But you need to know what your position is if you don't ha have the featured snippet. And the way to do that, ampersand num equals nine. Now, you could take my word for it and blog about it and tweet it and so forth, feel free. But you can also test it for yourself. Right? Just go on, hop onto Google, do a search, oh, there's a featured snippet. What happens if I add ampersand num equals 9 to the Google SERP URL? Oh, no more featured snippet. Oh, and the, the, the listing from page 2 is now showing up. So it's, it, it's an empirical science. Yeah, I would also recommend to research whatever you hear and definitely take things with a grain of salt until you've researched it further if you know you, you don't know who's saying it if they're not really credible or you don't really know their background their SEO background and research it um, for example like there are myths out there that just won't die these SEO myths that someone started and then bunch of people just kind of jumped on and then that just spread like wildfire and still are alive today like meta keywords tags people think that you should be putting keywords in there and it's a complete waste of time Google doesn't doesn't look at that for the most part anyway um, Google does not look at your meta keywords tags. I mean your 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 title tag that's important to be filling out uh, with your your keyword rich titles make sure it's written for humans not bots as well don't keyword stuff in there but make sure those are keyword rich and then your uh, meta descriptions which aren't going to it doesn't matter what keywords Google isn't looking at the keywords in your meta descriptions but you're writing those purely for your users because it'll usually show up as the description of your listing in the search so make sure you're filling those out about your meta keywords tags you don't have to be filling those out and many people to this day still think you should be doing that so that's just one example of these myths that kind of circulate and people just kind of jump on and just believe it um, and and are doing these things that are a total waste of time so do your research and now I'll, I'll spin it a different way a little bit um, every keyword has a different intent Every keyword is affected by where you are geographically, and the rankings of every keyword is impacted by time of day, believe it or not. So the intent at 2 a.m. may not match the intent at 2 p.m., and we have to understand that. And as a result, how many keywords are there, that's how many algorithms there are. So we're not going to have a one-size-fits-all kind of a relationship between this is working for e-commerce, therefore it'll work for information sites and vice versa. And not even every keyword is going to behave the same way. So when we get into this, there isn't a rule that says, if you push this green button, you will always rank because other keywords rank. Every keyword is different. You're going to have to test it, and you're going to have to do it. Um, don't be surprised by the results you don't get for the work you didn't do. And it's not sufficient to just go into incognito mode to do your search. You're still getting localized uh, results. It still knows your IP address. So understand, this is SEO on a keyword-by-keyword -keyword basis is a separate project. 
If you have 100 keywords, you have 100 projects. And the behavior of this technique, which works for this kind of keyword, may very well not work for that kind of keyword. So you're going to have to do SEO. There isn't a shortcut where I say, well, half my keywords, if I do this, they'll all perform better. That is very unlikely. All right, next question. Okay, so my question is similar to the other one where I have an existing site, there's probably a thousand pages, and for a long time, you know, we'd write the same, relatively the same similar content, and we might have multiple rankings on page one or page two. As Google has, you know, diversified what's on, you know, not the same domain across the same page as much now, um, though some of our rankings have fallen off, and now we're left with a lot of extra content. So question is like what is, is there a methodology that you would recommend we check out that would help us understand like what the cannibalization of keywords are on various content on our site and then how to best kind of do internal linking to push towards the content we want to rank on a certain keyword any any thoughts on that what tools are you using currently we, for the most part, are using AccuRanker to look at you know, what content's ranking. We use Search Console to look at, um, you know, what pages might rank for a different query. And, f and then we're kind of running through an optimization process where we'll strengthen the content, maybe combine two posts, three, you know, no index, index at old piece, 301 to the, to the new piece. Um, but then it really what it comes down to is, I think, the internal linking. Uh, what we should be doing with internal linking to maybe find, I don't know, five or ten places. If you guys have any recommendations on number of internal links, uh, I guess to create sort of the, the structure, the hierarchy you were talking about, are we trying to use content to, to sort of internal link to one piece of content we want to rank on that, that main keyword? I don't know if there's any methodologies, number of internal links, anchor text, that you would recommend exact match? Do we want to be diverse with the internal linking anchor text? I don't know if you have any thoughts on any of that. There's a lot of methodologies out there. Okay. Uh, we follow our own particular methodology. Uh, you might want to read up on something called uh, SEO silos. Um, from the standpoint of tools, we also have our own set of tools. And uh, the tools are, they include ranking monitors, they include Majestic, through an API, it includes all the stuff that we do that actually allows us to do top shelf SEO. Uh, and it even includes our plugin for WordPress. So we can do quite a bit at a tool level to give you an indication of different things. Like what, we have a patent pending technology built in that we get to put in a keyword, we pull the top results from Google, we analyze them, and we tell you what Google's rewarding. So that kind of technology could really help you. Again, it's a keyword by keyword by keyword basis, but we could help you quite a bit. Your methodology of do I have five links or 10 links or uh, how many words and things like that, that will come uh, actually through experimentation. Because as I mentioned earlier, I believe that every keyword is different. The behavior of this keyword in this structure is what's gonna matter to you. Right? So when, yeah, we guess, write, when we write a blog post, for instance, we make the blog post actually connect to our website, and we make the website connect to the, web, to the blog post, but we don't arbitrarily say we need 10 links to do it. Okay. It might just be one. Okay. We just need it to be integrated into the website. Great. I was just going to follow up. You mentioned SEO siloing. That was more or less what I was asking about. Uh, without, you know, we're not starting new where we can sort of from scratch map out the content. We have, you know, a big site that's now needs to be redirected. So you're saying that the tools you have and uh, the other tools you mentioned are the way that you, at a keyword level, you would just go through and, and look for opportunities to, to build in the silos with existing content, with that, even if you're not starting from scratch. Right, it'll give you a lot of information to do that. One site I really like from an internal linking standpoint, they've just really nailed it, it's the New York Times. If you just do a search for Iraq in Google, for example, you will find a topic page from the New York Times for Iraq ranking in the fir first page, like top five uh, positions. And the page isn't even that good, but it is internally linked so strongly that it 
by the fact uh, of the sheer authority and trust that the New York Times uh, domain has and the way that they're internally linking, it's pretty awesome. So think of ways that you can incorporate, like the New York Times, links to topic pages that are relevant in not just a kind of a brain dead way, such as listing the links at the bottom where categories and tag links, you know, related uh, links, but actually work it into the page copy, into the blog post, the article. Uh, another thing too that you said you lost a lot of rankings. I wouldn't just look at your linking because you didn't just suddenly m move your internal linking structure around, right, and caused you to lose ranking. Something happened. There was an algorithm update or, you know, something else. What is it that is wrong with, the, the, there are three pillars to SEO, and if, you know, the content or the, the, the technical architecture or the links are weak, it's like sitting on a two-legged stool. You will fall over. So one of those could be contributing and not the thing that you're thinking of. Maybe it's not internal linking at all. Maybe it's the content quality doesn't meet the, it's not up to snuff anymore. And, and one tool that I'm not sure if any of you guys are aware of it, but it's, it's from Google Cloud. It's their natural language API. It's an AI, a machine learning algorithm, AutoML, and it uses a uh, huge training uh, data set, but you can use that um, technology. You don't even have to pay for it. You can just take your article copy, paste it into the little uh, demo text box, and hit go and see what the salient scores are for all the different entities, the different keywords. In other words, entities are more than just individual keywords, but I'm oversimplifying. But the idea here is that your salient score will probably be very low for the keywords or the topics that you care about for many of these pages. And, and you just don't know, but Google's getting smarter and smarter. Their machine learning uh, algorithms are taking over a lot of stuff over at the Googleplex. So you, you got to keep up with this stuff. In fact, can we uh, switch to the screen and I'll, I'll just quickly show you what I'm talking about here. This is the natural language API page. And if you just scroll down a little bit, this is the text box that says try the API. Just highlight the whole text inside of that text box, hit delete, paste in the copy from your home page, from some landing page, product page, article, blog post, and then hit the analyze button and it will do the calculation. Like for example, if I, um, can I pick on you, Bruce? Oh. <laughs> yes, you may. <laughs> I've never tried this with Bruce's page, but let's do it. Copy and paste and analyze. I got to prove I'm not a robot. And then you scroll down. These are all the entities. SEO salient score of 0 0.12. That could be better. I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and ironically, uh, your salience for Bruce Clay is 0 0.05. You might want to work on that. Anyway, so that's the tool. It's that easy. It's super cool. And I'm sorry to pick on you, Bruce. I didn't know. Oh, it's OK. <laughs> I should have done that test earlier. And uh, I, I want my colleague to look good. So that is free. And how many people knew that the, that tool existed? One person. See? Yeah, it's a great tool. I also wanted to touch on uh, that for a second as well, what Stefan was saying, where it might be something else I was going to say before, that don't focus too much on internal linking more than something that's more important, for example, like your inbound links, right? So your, your inbound link profile is going to be much more important than your internal linking. Um, so take a look at your Majestic Trust Flow and your AH refs, UR ratings and things like that. Look at your authority and work on building your links. Also, if you have a massive amount of links already, then run a link detox report on LRT, Link Research Tools. It's a really, really great tool for looking at your kind of domain-wide uh, link toxicity score and seeing if you have some toxic links in there that's bringing down your authority and then disavowing those. So 
make sure that you're, you're, you're focusing on the bigger picture and not getting you know, too crazy about this small, small part of it. Um, and another thing that came to mind also with, with your internal linking, for example, if you have a page that you really want to rank high in the Google search results and it's really, really deep inside your content, like you have to click on multiple pages to, to get to it, um, consider moving uh, that to like your main nav. Um, make sure it's not so deep in there because you want to have that be accessed from the home page or any, any page throughout the website. So add a link in your main nav to those pages as well. Just find a way to, to add that in there so it's not so deep. One thing uh, we haven't talked on yet, but I'm going to throw it in, is page load speed. How many people think their speed is fast enough? Mm -hmm. Okay, why don't you go back to my home page and then pick a sub page? Now pick any sub page. Okay. If you can't do that, you're slow. Who knows about GT metrics? Okay, all of you. Great. Um, how about what are some other tools that they should know about? Uh, webpagetest.org. Who knows about that? Yep. Okay, so definitely webpagetest.org. That that's the tool that powers um, Google's uh, Think with Google Test My Site tool. And what else? Uh, well, Google has the PageSpeed Analyzer. Yeah. Uh, oh, if you're, do you want to mention about the Chrome uh, user experience? Go ahead. Okay. So when you're using PageSpeed Insights, if you have a, a popular enough site, gets enough traffic of Chrome users, then it'll show actual user data of what their experience is in terms of uh, page load times. That's way better than just getting uh, the the tools guess based on wherever it's checking from whatever data center. So the things, oh, oh, real quick, one of the things that we did is we went to WebP all images, uh, which doesn't work in Safari, so you have to do some coding around it. Uh, we went to HTTP2, which was an amazing upgrade. If you don't have it on your server, it takes like five minutes to install. It's like a plug-in, except for your server. Uh, HTTP2 decreased our page load time over 35%. So you're going to want to do that. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff. We lazy load all our images. So when we uh, go to a page, you can see how fast it loads. But then everything below the fold loads later. And so uh, it takes four seconds to load our site, but it takes less than a half second to display everything above the fold. So you want to look at that for user experience and actually for the search engines as well. And make sure you're looking at both your uh, mobile and desktop loading uh, speeds, especially mobile, because most of your traffic is probably coming from mobile already if you look at your Google Analytics. So make sure that your site is loading quickly on mobile, or you can get you know, pinged for that um, from Google if you have a really low uh, loading site on mobile. So make sure you're looking at both those scores and, and doing everything you can to, to up your speeds. And I'm going to go back to the original statement. Uh, when we started, voice search is exceptionally responsive to speed. So if you expect to have a featured snippet, if you expect to have it show up, voice search is going to be very, very critical. So we're going to have to pay attention to that. Next question. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. You guys have been doing this a long time. All right. Next question. I want to <laughs> give, give uh, just a quick scenario. So let's say diamond engagement rings, right? Um, you could look at the top two sites there. and One is really uh, content rich, I would say. And the other one has access to about 12,000 diamond engagement rings very fast um, on Hybris, uh, has an in engagement ring sizer. So, now, the one thing you'll see in that space is that for years, especially in the early 2000s or the late 2000s, before content marketing became the rebranding of SEO, right? Um, people would create a knowledge center, right? And and you can see this across, especially some of the older diamond engagement ring type sites. So my question is, how nowadays, especially in a very competitive space, how is it that you? go about researching what kind of content will differentiate, right? If there's already 
uh, a thousand articles out there on the top hundred sites about the five C's of diamonds, and there's already engagement ring sizers, or pick another industry, but w what is your process of analyzing and, and discovering new content that could potentially move the needle, especially for a very aggressive space? Um, I would, the first thing that comes to mind for me is providing unique value with your article or your content, um, making sure that there's something that, that makes it stand out from all the other um, articles or pages of content that are in that space already. So provide that unique value. That's really that comes to mind, the first thing. Yeah, what I look for is uh, an opportunity to create something that is remarkable, worthy of remark, to, to use uh, Seth Godin's definition of remarkable. And that doesn't mean it has to be the best, the most interesting, most useful, most controversial, most humorous, or whatever piece of content. It just needs to have something about it that is worthy of remark, and, and thus a purple cow. So I look for opportunities to create a curiosity gap, or to something that's counterintuitive, something that will make people do a double take when they're kind of scanning through all the stuff in their news feeds or you know, wh wherever they're consuming content. Because I'm trying to reach the linkerati with that content and, and grab them. So if I can do something that's a little bit uh, cognitive dissonance, let's say that, that um, you know, the five C's of, of uh, diamonds, if I have somebody who's, let's say, a, a little old granny teaching that, that's a little cognitive dissonance. So it's a little counterintuitive. That might capture their attention. There's actually a set of viral videos from this uh, little old lady who teaches cooking or something, but she swears like a truck driver, and it's awesome. She's really hilarious. Who's ever seen any of those? Yeah, a couple of you. She's awesome and very remarkable. So look for ways to be remarkable. That will get you uh, higher quality links. That will get you more buzz, more social spread, and, and, and sharing and all that. Yeah, I've always heard that if it isn't shareable, it isn't worth writing. So you're going to have to pick topics. You're going to have to understand what keywords are actually common to the top ranked sites. So if I have 10 pages, uh, it may very well be that all 10 use the same kind of keywords. I just want to find a unique way to utilize those keywords and, and commingle it into my content in a natural way. And I think that's really uh, the overall goal. Yeah. Uh, we are pretty much out of time. I've oh, got can I say one, one quick thing? Go. OK, so a few of you got copies of my book at the beginning of the session. Everybody here will get a free digital copy of Google Power Search. So you just send a text, whip out your phone, send a text to 33444 with the keyword ASW2020. And I'll also include a uh, free chapter, or not free, a module of my SEO auditing course, uh, the module on technical uh, glitches and, and easy fixes. So that'll be for everybody. So ASW2020 is the keyword, and then 33444. In my case, it's a little bit different. If you have a piece of paper or a business card, a card would be better. Uh, write the word tools across it, and I'll give you all a free month subscription to all my tools. So I can do that as well if you want to bring those cards up. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much for coming. I hope you've enjoyed the session. Remember, the rating is 10. <laughs> I tried an 11 once, but everybody had problems with it. So. Thank you very much. Session's over. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you.